I'm Stephen Price. Hello, I'm Cara Githens. This is The Innkeepers, a podcast by Sanctuary Inn. At Sanctuary Inn, we believe we are called to equip, refresh, and restore God's global workers. On this podcast, we will be interviewing guests who have much to teach us about the many facets of missionary care. Let's learn together and be encouraged to press on in the work God has given each one of us to do. Well, we'd like to welcome you back to the Innkeepers podcast. This is Steve. Hello, this is Kara. And today on our podcast interview, we have the opportunity to interview Brian Heerwagen. Brian has been a personal friend for many years, but since uh, 1997, Brian has served officially in the capacity of missions pastor at Montevilla Church in Portland, Oregon. Uh, Brian is married to Lorraine. They were married in 86. They have three grown daughters that are married and so far five grandchildren. Yeah, and Brian is also the CEO of Standards of Excellence, formerly Delta Ministries, um, which started in 1985. And he's been on countless short-term trips and uh, has partnered a lot with missionaries and uh, missions organizations over the years in that role as well. Yeah, I know he's been a champion for our family as we've served uh as missionaries from Montevilla Church, which we still are, we continue in that capacity. That's something that began for us in the early 90s, 93, 92, 93, something like that. And we have been uh, missionaries with Montevilla um, almost continuously since that point. And even though Brian wasn't officially in the capacity of missions pastor, he's just kind of been a champion for our family. He's been a champion for all the missionaries, really, that Montevilla serves. And so it's just going to be a pleasure to be able to just spend some time with Brian today. So um, as we talk to Brian, we're going to talk with him and kind of focus on the role of the missions leader, missions pastor, and their missionaries in a local church setting. Welcome to this episode of the Innkeepers podcast, and we have the opportunity and privilege and blessing to have Brian Heerwagen on the program with us today. Brian serves um, in a lot of different roles, but today we're talking about his role at Montevilla Church in Portland, Oregon, and his role as the missions pastor in that local church. So Brian, let's talk just uh, a little bit about your missions journey and so on and uh, I know um, you've been part of our family and um, our missions journey for many many years but let's hear a little bit of your story well it starts with mm, almost one of those typical testimonies of being saved as a kid my story is a little unique though in that not only was I saved as a kid but it was about the same time as my parents were saved Mm. my family had actually relocated by Volkswagen van to the Ozark Mountains to escape normal function in life and instead to go back to the earth to find peace and happiness. And my parents ended up moving nearby in the mountains to Christian couples who loved them to the Lord, which is a wonderful story in and of itself. But as kids, we followed uh, our parents in faith. And so I grew up in a new Christian home, not with a Christian heritage, if you will, uh, in fact, the heritage my parents represented was, uh, it's a tough one in some ways. I mean, um, middle-class homes, but some other things that were peculiar in their growing up. So they really had to forge um, the Christian faith for our household. And all of us as kids were then being raised in that setting. I think in some ways that gave us as kids a tender heart toward those who are unsaved or Uh pre-saved and toward those who would eventually grow in their faith uh, instead of just being raised in a typical Christian home. But um, you ask about background, what brings me to the place that I am in missions and even commented that I've been around for some of the things your family's been through. Uh, I will say since my high school years, when I first started doing short-term mission trips, that I've been around missions and churches and foreign mission fields for all of those years. Now, uh, that means, you know, 40 plus years of hanging around missionaries, mission fields, churches, pastors, and other leaders. And 
Um, yeah, it's been a joy. It's been a challenge. There's always with anything, there's ups and downs, but God's agenda is extraordinary. And I've loved being part of it. And I'm excited to talk about some of those things even today as we look at local churches and what a mission, mission pastor can do. So your role is a missions pastor at Montevallo Baptist Church. And what what does that encompass? What are some of the responsibilities? What does your church well, take on? <laughs> we'll talk about some of the changes. I've been doing it now for 25 years, I think, at Montevallo Church. Um, we do have a global outreach team. And together we work to manage the aspect of our church that we call missions, which is both local and global. Our church supports about 27 missionaries and a few uh, organizations as well who are involved in mission work. So uh, nearly 30 that we pay attention to and try to maintain a relationship with. So maybe we can unpack a little bit about how we maintain relationships, what our GO team does as we go through today's uh, interview, um, and even perhaps visit some of the changes. But I do want to mention one of our themes or mottos has been to help missions be an upbeat an ever-present part of the life of Montevilla Baptist Church. And of course, you always take a lot of time to think through all the words you use when you write something like that. But we wanted it to be part of the life of Montevilla, not a subset or a line item in a budget, but part of how we live at our church. Mm -hmm. And we wanted it to be upbeat. Uh, in the old days, it was oftentimes asking for money or perhaps only rolled around as a massive amount of information at budget time. And we wanted it to be a happy, um, pleasant part of our life. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and just always around. Uh, so our church services, I can talk a little bit about how we integrate missions into our services and some other things so that it's just always present. Mm -hmm. And that's been important to us. And I think it's really been transformative for us as a church. And I think it's also really affected our missionaries. Mm -hmm. So what do you do on a weekly basis to keep um, missions in front of the congregation? That's a good question. And I would imagine some of the listeners, either your missionaries who struggle with ever having time in front of a church that supports you, or you're maybe listening as someone from a church who's always trying to figure out how to put missionaries in front of the people, right? Um, we've gone to some really simple background uh, efforts. And one of them that has been really probably the most successful for us is what we call dollar a month. It's a an offering that we do. We use little envelopes in the uh, church the sanctuary there and the chairs or po chair pockets there for folks. And it's cash only. It's not receipted. That's just collected all month and people can give a buck or more or less when they're able. And here's how that one in particular has been so good for us. I'm a big fan of working smarter, not harder. Uh -huh. And if I want Montevilla to be the kind of church where missions is upbeat and ever present. Now what I get to do a dollar a month is almost every Sunday that missionary who is our dollar a month, I present about them. There's a picture on the slides that go up pre-service or during the service. I may choose even in my brief mention about them to tell where they live and serve one week. And the next week I'll tell what they do, where they live. I might mention about their family on another week. I keep it super short so I don't abuse the privilege of being on that special, special platform schedule. But that means every, every month our people are hearing about a missionary, their family, their ministry, their location. So from an educational standpoint, our GO team is thrilled. I remember before we started doing this, that I could ask randomly if people could name on their own without looking at any budget sheet or any directory missionaries that our church supports. And the most I could get anyone to come up with was four out of about 30, right? Mm -hmm. With this dollar a month now, every week almost, and month after month, they're getting to know missionaries without missionaries having to be in front of the platform or come back from overseas. And now people can list 15 or 20 of our missionaries from memory. So educationally, we benefit greatly. But I'll also tell you, we've raised almost $80,000 since we started doing this in 2007. That's crazy. Dollar at a time. I mean, some of our uh, the elderly on super fixed incomes feel like they're contributing where uh -huh. before they were sad, they couldn't give enough to make a difference. Our kids feel like throwing a quarter in there's helpful. Yeah. Sometimes there's a hundred dollar bill or a $20 bill in an envelope. People feel generous or know a missionary better than another, but it averages around 700 bucks a month for a missionary. And so we got education. We've also got an ability for our church not only be learning, but also giving. And here's the other piece. Do you have any idea what an encouragement is to a missionary? 
Mm-hmm. They suddenly get this random gift mm-hmm. that has no strings attached. And we get mm-hmm. these thank you letters back from missionaries who say, oh, my goodness, you can't believe the perfect timing of that gift. We needed such and such, and it was just the right amount. So it has been on every front a blessing, and it's a part of subtly making missions mm-hmm. not be an ever-present part of the life of Montevilla Baptist. So um, that's just one of the examples to answer your question. Yeah. So, Brian, as you as you interact with uh, missionaries and budgets, of course, and dollars and cents, it's a it's a big deal. And um, you have cross cultural workers asking for money all the time. You have people applying to be supported by Montevilla, mm-hmm. and then you have people um, that Montevilla has supported for years. Um, our family among them. Um, so. How do you work through that process, and how do you interact with your missionaries as you uh, work on support issues? There are a couple of principles that probably need to be applied first, and these they are sort of the Sunday school answer almost. But I think when a church simply says, hey, missions team, you get 8% of our budget, figure out how you want to spend it, it's not a bad thing. But I love instead when leadership in the church says to the GO team, we trust you and your spiritual journey of discerning the needs of your missionaries. You tell us where we are, what you think, and what the needs are. Now, that's how our church does it. They put, in a sense, a spiritual spin on what needs to be done, not a business spin. And I don't want to be misunderstood as being critical of one or the other. It's just that I think starting first— with one missionary and considering what they're doing, what their needs are and praying that through and making a discerning choice about them. And then moving on to the next missionary and doing the same thing, praying, considering and discerning is really quite fascinating with now 27 plus line items that we manage this way. When we're all done, we roll it together and see what the impact is. Did the mission budget go up or down? How big is the change and how do we explain it to our elders, Uh our congregation, but it is truly a spirit led movement then rather than a logistical or business movement. I think though that sounds a little churchy to be spiritual first, I think it's the right place to start. Now, an important factor to that is that means we have to be in relationship and communication with each of our missionaries. And so we have to find out before budget season, how are you doing? Tell us truthfully, what percentage of support are you at? What are your needs? Do you have any unmet needs, et cetera? Just so we have a scope of the need. And we do have some missionaries who, by policy, don't share that information routinely, but only when asked. And we also have some who like to put it in every email. (laughs) We never have to wonder. But we do have to do some digging and then some praying and some unique discerning before we roll it together and present it to our church. And I don't remember any time in 20 plus years that it's ever been changed or declined by our congregation when they know how it's come from and that the Lord's probably already paved a way for it. One thing that stands out to me is that you have a go team. That means you have a team of people working together to care for your missionaries. Can you describe what that team is like? (laughs) Yes. Obviously, we want people who love the Lord and love missions and care about that. We also want people who are willing to put in the hours on those occasions when hours are required. Uh, I'm a real stickler, though, because I realize everyone's a volunteer and are serving by choice, and they have daytime jobs and families and all of that. Um, I'm real clear with our GO team members that it's okay that when there's nothing to do that they don't do anything. I don't want them to feel guilty all year, like, I don't feel like I'm contributing enough. Uh They have an expectation, a job description. They have a certain thing they're responsible for, and sometimes they've got to be really busy. Mm -hmm. And then the other two-thirds of the year, there'd be nothing to do. And for me, that's okay. I would rather have them on the team and excelling in their area and praying with us routinely and showing up at meetings then have somebody feel guilty all year long who doesn't know for sure what they're supposed to do. So keys in that, key areas. First, a love for missions, willingness to put in the time, but also clear job description expectations that are logical and make sense and freedom for people to not do anything if it's not required. Meanwhile, lean in 100% when it is required. And that builds a really great team. Our GO team handles hospitality, budget, policies, um, just to name a few of the categories, just by six or seven main categories, um, production of a, a routine newsletter that goes out to our missionaries. We feel like as much as we expect them to keep us informed, 
we're a partner. So they need to know what's going on in their supporting church as well. So we keep pushing out encouraging notes, letters from our pastors, um, updates about who's getting married and who's passed away and who's going into missions. So we got somebody who manages that as well. So that that's our go team. Mm-hmm. How many people are on your team? Um, right now, I believe there are 11. That's a mm-hmm. good sized team. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's okay. great. Thanks. I think that'd be helpful for someone looking at their church and saying, hey, how can we come around our missionaries? Often, I think there's usually one or two people in church kind of charging ahead. And I think a team can really make a difference. Yeah, and I suppose a little bit of that comes down to a leadership style, uh, especially in volunteer roles. And if you don't think you, if you don't think missions has a good place or voice, I think sometimes someone will kind of hunker down and figure it's faster if I just do it. Nobody else knows how to do it. So perhaps they take on a little bit too much and even from a slightly defensive posture. And if we're going to be an upbeat, ever-present part of the life of Montevilla Baptist, there's no defensiveness there. We'll take what we can get. We'll respectfully forge ahead in any area we can work into. We take volunteers in who have gifts, but we only ask them to apply them when they're necessary. There's just this liberating place for a team to serve instead of that um, burdensome role that one or two might fill by just hanging on to everything and fighting for something. Yeah. Very different atmosphere. Yeah. Also, the advantage of your team is that with more people on the team, you have the exposure to more people in the church. So Mm -hmm. you have um, one couple that has interaction in a particular sphere of influence and another couple and another influence or a single here or a single there. And they can um, they're there. People know who they are. Generally, they can ask questions and they can answer questions. And it's not one person trying to answer everyone's questions. So that is a, a shared burden there too. It is. And it also creates pathways back into different categories yeah. of your church. Uh, if we need to promote something, having someone who represents young people or young couples or uh, young families or the elderly class or whatever means we got pathways directly into those uh, circles, which is amazing. Yeah. Okay. Well, missions is changing and it's always changing. Uh, you know, you look back to the early years and um, England and, you know, men often leaving their families, going mm-hmm. to um, India and other places, uh, doing missions work, uh, evolving through the early 20th century and so on with lots of families, couples, individuals headed out, going different places, post-World War II, a surge of people getting Bible education and going to the mission field to being supported by multiple churches and, you know, a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of energy going into missions. And now um, the model's changing where we have churches taking on majority support of missionaries and so on. Can you just talk about that a little bit? Mm. Yeah, you're actually uh, opening up uh, a doorway into a very important and a pretty vast topic. Um, Let me first say for our listeners' sake, I am by no means an expert on all this. And just because I've been helping to lead a mission movement in my church for 20 plus years doesn't make me like the perfect answer guy for that. But you ought to know, too, I'm involved now for almost 40 years in a national leadership of mission efforts and running a lot of mission circles. So uh, when you bring this subject up, I got to tell you the truth. My mind goes into like four or five really big, really important categories I don't have opportunity to go into all those today, but let me try and be succinct about something here. The first thing, it's a global or, again, a principle type thing. Uh, It is a soapbox of mine, but the idea that traditional mission as we know it is the right way or that mission sending agencies is the correct way is something I think we need to be really guarded about. I'm going to come back and tell you why they're important and why things about them have evolved to where they are. We need those things, but... When I look at the Bible and history, I see that very few things that God ever has done that's recorded for us to look at is conventional. There are very few ordinary or routine things that God ever did. I remember one story where King David, his army had already defeated the troops in one battle, and they were amped up and ready to go out for the next battle. And the Lord said, wait, hold on. I want you to be very still and listen until you hear the leaves and the trees rustle. Because if you don't do it that way, I'm not going to give this next battle to you. So here's these excited warriors who are listening (laughs) 
for the leaves, right? What about these poor guys around Jericho? I mean, again, excited warriors who are supposed to silently what? Walk yeah. around. Right. You know the stories. And it, it goes on through the Old Testament and the New Testament, and there's really no two stories the same. So mm-hmm. I'm not saying God is spastic or random. He's super intentional. He knows everything. But what I am saying is that he is not conventional in the ways that we think of conventionality. And so for us to cling to tradition to tradition or convention is probably not the healthiest place for us to be as individuals or churches. Now, don't let the pendulum swing and say, yay, yes, let's abandon all structures, because the reason mission agencies do what they do today is because there have been amazing and terrible prices paid for ineffective Mm. mobilization of people, especially nowadays Mm. with things the way they are with the courts of law. Uh, There's just so many complications. So now to dial in a little bit on your question, churches that want to send people by themselves without all the protection of liabilities and insurances and the kind of pre-field, post-field, on-field care, this is probably extremely high risk and unnecessary organizations that have emerged in the last 100 to 150 years have emerged to provide those kinds of uh, care elements that typically churches by themselves can't provide. So I do think people need to be a little looser when it comes to convention, but not abandon it. I think they need to find efficient pathways, probably with sending entities who are contemporary and willing to try new things because Everything around us has changed. It is appropriate for us to be contemporary to the day. Find the kind of organizations that provide background and underground services and tie in with them anyway. When it comes to giving, children, education, risk, crisis, I could go on the whole list. We do need that kind of support and help. So if you're a church and you want to do it all by yourself, I do know of a church that's doing it. They're doing it extremely well. It's the only church in America I know about that is, <laughs> and I represent a lot of churches in a sense. So I would say, don't just jump off and do it. Learn a lot before you decide to make that big of an effort. Otherwise, find good contemporary pathways that provide good services and stick with it. Yeah. I know Cara's, uh, Cara's family was part of a time when they had multiple supporting churches. Yeah, my family, when I was a kid, we went out and my, I think my parents had around 40 supporting churches. I mean, but this is, what, 35 years ago. And so it's just, um, times have changed and now churches seem to either support one or two missionaries or three. It seems like they want to know their missionary more. But then how does support happen for when the monetary needs are still the same or more than they used to be. So it's just, it's a challenge, I think, that we're trying to, missionaries are trying to navigate that. It's a really tough one right now. Churches are not feeling the pain of that, of course, like those who have to raise support. Um, so I, all I can do there is sort of resonate with that. I am also a fully supportive missionary and have to do the same. I used to have uh, 11 churches that supported us. We now have only three. And on top of that, because we've been raising support for so many years, we have uh, individuals or families who are supporting us who have either mm-hmm. gone out of fixed incomes or there are people who have passed away since. So yeah. trying to replace mm-hmm. support for those where they drop off or where churches have to stop supporting us, it's a big challenge today. And I, I just have to say, in all the circles I run in, there is not an easy answer for that. Mm-hmm. I personally challenge, and I do coaching with churches, I challenge them to be careful not to create blanket policies. Uh, I've sat with churches who say, well, we're only going to support missionaries who serve in this country or in this people group or missionaries who came from our church. I think they need to leave room for the unconventionality of God and leave room for exceptions, if you will, without it feeling like they're just random again. They need some controls, but don't just completely cut it off because it eliminates the possibility of God breathed, God ordained plans that perhaps they could be part of. So Mm -hmm. that they wouldn't wouldn't know about in the policy making necessarily. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Some, some of the concern is that um, people, I mean, missionaries that I know that were supported largely by one church and then Mm -hmm. there's a staff change, a pastoral change, something. And then the, all of a sudden the focus of the giving of the church changes 
and a missionary gets an email saying, you know, all that money we were giving you, we're not going to give you that or we're going to give you part of that. And it doesn't, it's not even a phone call. It's an email usually. And, and all of a sudden, you know, it's like someone in the working world whose boss comes up to them and says, you know, I need you to do the same amount of work, but you know, we're going to cut your salary 30%. And I think you'll be okay, but we just needed you to know that. So anyway, it's can important. I, yeah. Can I be really transparent here about yes. that? Yeah, <laughs> on a couple of fronts. First of all, um, you just described some things in my life. I actually have a church a while ago that was a major supporter that they decided there's only three things that they're going to do, and it doesn't include international missions and on and on. And uh, they didn't let me know. Oh, wow. I just noticed that for the last couple of months, that gift hasn't been there. So uh, I, there's two things I want to say here. Number one is as supporting supported missionaries, we really have to be on our toes about this kind of cynicism and criticism that can come. Mm. Uh, I know the people at that church well enough, and I did call them and find out what a spirit-led, challenging and painful process that has been for them. And because I kept the door open, I now trust that what they did is, I'm quite confident, the Lord's leadership in their church. It seems strange to me. It's unconventional. But my first reaction was very frustrated, very disappointed, and absolutely critical of their short-sightedness. Because, of course, my mission matters more than any of their other agendas, and I doubt they're listening to God, otherwise they'd know it, right? Otherwise they'd know that, yeah. (laughs) Right? But also I would say from a church standpoint, if anyone is listening to this as a church leader, it is far better for you to communicate in advance of the possibility. And finally, if the decision is made, let the missionaries know. Don't be afraid. Yeah. Don't put it off and procrastinate and let them find out the hard way. That's where the, the hurt or the sadness comes. Yeah. Um, and God is bigger than any one church's support for us. So he knew this. He can replace it. If someone dies or a church stops or whatever, he knew that. So I will recommend an amazing book. If you haven't already read it, you need to. It's called Unoffendable by Brant Hansen. Huh. Unoffendable, entirely practical biblically centered book. And it has been, it's been good for me uh, in these last uh, 12, 15 months as uh, we've been going through such major things globally and it's affecting my life, my mission to remember um, about the things in that book. So I, I really think it's a beautiful, enjoyable book. And if you want to listen to it, Brandt actually is the author and the reader and he does a fabulous job. It's a great book to listen to. Life changing. Great. So what have you heard about local churches and missionary care that uh, has impressed you? Because we just talked Mm. a little bit about eh, maybe not so great to just drop your missionary, but there are some people doing some great work out there. What what Mm -hmm. are some examples you know of? Well, I'm going to let me just dial that into our own church, um, especially because of the circumstances we're facing due to even the pandemic. Uh, interaction with other churches right now and even hospitality has been greatly challenged. But I will tell you this, it's been one of the most amazing and special things at our church with our supported missionaries that when they are home on home assignment or furlough, whatever you call it, that they just live with us. Uh, We don't have much platform time. Like most churches, we don't have all those prayer meetings and evening services. And so giving away any time is almost impossible. But the old school approach is I'm coming home from the field. I'm supposed to be in front of the people. Otherwise I may lose support. So when can I speak? When can I present? And I keep telling all of our missionaries, you know, I, I'm not even going to try. We, we don't have that. I I represent you faithfully throughout the year. What I really want you to do is attend church, sit in Sunday school classes. If you play the trumpet, play the trumpet in the worship team. Steve knows who I'm talking about. Um, Live with us because that's where we get the best mileage ever. You're genuine, you're normal, you let your guard down a little bit, your hair down a little bit, whatever you want to call it, you're real. Mm -hmm. And our people love that. So to me, that's probably outside of what we ourselves are doing on your behalf. If you're a missionary coming home, that's what we want most from you is come be with us. That's all. Okay. So just giving them permission to, you know, it's not Mm. about you keeping raising money and convincing us, but just being a part of it. Exactly. Well said. Yeah. And I, I really, I have to work with them. In fact, we just had some missionaries come through recently, really tough to get any time with anybody because of masks and all of that. And I had to say again and again, I know what your mission tells you you're supposed to do. I know you're 
supposed to report meetings, but please, I'm telling you, enjoy your children. Enjoy the time off. Enjoy dinner when we sit together. I will represent you. We believe in you. In fact, we know your support need is real and we're going to consider an increase this next year. So stop the performance side of things yeah. and just be real and live and hang out and relax and don't feel guilty. It's yeah. a good ministry. Both ways. Yeah. So it's more of a relational model. I mean, relational versus performance. We mm. use the word performance, but so often missionaries <laughs> feel like they're being asked to perform and mm -hmm. be up front and do this and do that. But if um, if you're encouraging a relational model, I think, you know, go to Sunday school, go to the, you know, church picnics, go to dinner at someone's house and just spend time with them. Let other people, you know, let people get to know them face to face is going to mm. they go a long way uh, for that missionary. Let me add to what you just said. I love it. It just reminded me of something. But I think out of our 27 missionaries, we probably have three or four that could do pulpit fill. It's not the gifting of everybody. Yeah. There true. are most of our missionaries. If I get platform time, I do an interview. Yeah. Or if I can get them into Sunday school, we let them have a short presentation time and all the rest of the class is dedicated to interchange, exchange of information, question and answer. Use the missionaries. If you're a church, use the missionaries according to their gifting, not in, not according to the conventional performance mm -hmm plan. If you're a missionary, when you're going to be in a church, just be honest and say, you know, this isn't my forte, but I feel like what will get the most mileage is and tell them what works for you mm -hmm. and ask if it's okay to go that way. I love it when missionaries help me discern how they're best utilized in the relational time of their worth our church. So mm -hmm. yeah, good point, Steve. And what, uh, I think we've touched on this a little bit, but you expect some communication from the missionary. Mm -hmm. but Mm -hmm. local church supports what kinds of things <laughs> you want to hear um rather you know rather not just the email you know we're drowning we don't have money you know help 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 um but just talk about some of the things that are gonna you know you're gonna hear from and so you know you have a relationship with that missionary yeah well key word there is relationship or partnership we are not our church is not an atm machine for missionaries mm -hmm. They can't just expect cash to come out of this machine, and that's all that it is. So, yeah, um, we not only try to keep communication in a routine way, like the newsletter going their way, but when we are aware of things, someone from our team will advocate for them. It's amazing today with cell phones, we can actually call each other. Mm -hmm. With Zoom, we can see each other. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we've had quite a few of those. Anytime someone's coming to town, we'll try and meet up with them. This is, again, part of the ever present part of the life of Montevilla. We want to just mm. go through life real time. Um, so I would just utilize or leverage all the current brilliant connections that are possible. It does take some proactivity. It's easy out of sight, out of mind. If a mission pastor or people on the go team are not paying attention, months can go by without someone reaching out to a, a missionary. And we try, we want to avoid that. So um, I will, one quick thing we just did, of course, with the global situation we're facing and a lack of interaction that's possible, our GO team just divided up all of our missionaries uh, um, by, at first they said, you pick who you want first and I'll give out whoever doesn't find a place. Well, everybody picked everybody. So I had little, I had no work to do. We ended up with, everybody I think had four missionaries or three missionaries. And they just reached out and said, hey, can we do a Zoom or do you want to email and tell us what your prayer requests are? Because our GO team is meeting next week on Tuesday night. And we're just literally going to, there's no meeting, no explanation. We're praying through what you send us. We have so, such warm emails from people. They're like, no church has done that since this whole thing started where we're isolated. Thank you for loving us this way. And it's simple, but it takes a little proactivity, spend a little extra time, you get a lot of mileage out of it relationally. So. Mm -hmm. That's okay. great. How do you counsel someone when they come to you and mm. they say, hey, I'm interested in um, a career in missions or maybe a short midterm service? Like, what are the steps that you as the missions pastor take with them? Mm. Well, it's probably never really the same from one to the next. But if you haven't already picked up on this interview, certainly a high degree of God-centeredness matters to me. Is this mm -hmm. just because you speak a language, because you heard someone else who loved it, where this opportunity, I mean, why are you considering it? Yeah. Is there what we used to call, and we still do, a call on your life? Is mm -hmm. there this thing that won't be quiet in your soul? So I, I like to discern that first. 
I do also like to try to understand the pathway that they feel like they should take or if they have no pathway to help them discover one. But in this process, like some of what else I've shared today, I do challenge them to chase after obedience to the Lord, to be courageous about it, even if it's unconventional, because it probably will be, and not to be distracted by what everyone else is saying. Mm. Um, you need to listen to counsel, but sometimes counsel errors on the conventional side, or perhaps even not on the spirit-led side. They're just worried about safety or distance yeah. or risk. Mm -hmm. So I say, be obedient, take courage. Whatever you do, do it with excellence. Choose well, put your whole heart in it, do everything the best that you can. That means getting training and counsel and embrace whatever unconventional thing he may ask you to do. Because in this day and age, I feel like more of the craziest things ever are taking place. I hope it's mostly spirit led, but I know some people are just renegade crazies doing stuff. But if it's something strange, do it. And by the way, some people are feeling called to um, an effort that is perhaps a three-year plan or five-year plan, which longtime missionaries say, no, 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 it has to be a lifetime of engaging in culture. Yeah, there's a place for that. But nowadays it's 2021. The world has become very small thanks to the internet and cell phone technology and travel. I mean, literally, um, people can go anywhere and people have gone anywhere. So it can be done more strategically without all the Bible training. You need Bible training, but it doesn't have to be like four years of school, three years of seminary, seven years of support raising. Well, it, it can be that. There's a lot yeah, of other ways yeah. to get there. So I like to help people find yeah. those pathways that fit where God is in this day, it's contextualized to 2021 and beyond. So I don't know, that's, that's a lot of answer to your question, but that's what I, I have to spend time customizing with people, listening to the call, the, the passion they have, helping them be obedient, courageous, do it really well. And if it's unconventional, be brave to even go there. And I'm guessing you have also not only build the relationship with the person who is wanting to go and coaching them and supporting them, but also you have built a network of relationships with various organizations mm -hmm. so that you can say, hey, I, I can trust to pass you off to this person at this organization. That they can see if they're a good fit for you or that there's kind of a two, you're kind of the middleman. Yes, like, typically I'm already in relationship. And if I'm not, I will be. We'll build that friendship. As far as knowing other opportunities, perhaps my longevity gives me an insight that not all mission pastors are going to have, but there are wonderful resources to find placement. And if it's in every city people live in, in America anyway, or using the internet, there are great ways to find trusted pathways. So if I don't have one, we'll find one. I also need to, in fairness, say there are some times when there are people who say they're called to something, but it is a process of discerning that indeed that's not true. Mm -hmm. And then where is the grace and the truth that comes in helping someone land in a place that is right for them? And we have had to do that a few times. Um, or maybe they've chosen a path. It's one of the only ones they knew. And there's something better for them. And grace and truth, how do we help them consider a different pathway? Mm -hmm. um, so it's not always easy. It's not always just, hey, this great discovery process and everybody lands safely. Uh, sometimes there's yield signs or detour signs or stop signs. Yeah, for sure. You know, it's, it's a process and it's relational again. Yeah. yeah. Brian, we're grateful for your time. And as we kind of wrap things up, you have the opportunity here to speak to um, other churches, other mission pastors, mission volunteers, committee members. Is there anything, closing thought, something that you would like to share um, as a means of, by way of blessing or encouragement to them? Mm -hmm. I think the, the theme of joy and privilege comes to my mind while you're asking that question. I am uh, involved in a number of mission pastor gatherings and whatnot, and I hear people, maybe there's cynicism and a complaining spirit because it isn't easy doing missions anyway. And doing the mission part of church isn't always easy, but it is a joy to do anything we can do. It is a, a privilege to be a part of the greatest movement in all of world history, <laughs> yeah. and to be humble and to take it on with hope, even the little pieces we can have and do, it'll grow, it'll become more. But I think my challenge would be to shed the negative feelings or attitudes and to embrace 
the joy and privilege we do have and, and be patient, let it grow. I actually wanted to quit about 18 years ago. I'd only been in it for maybe, I don't know, two to five years with our church and a 30 year veteran in the mission pastorate when he heard I was wanting to quit said, don't, don't do it. I know it's not easy, but stay the course. And it was like a long conversation of me lamenting, uh, sometimes complaining, but I took his counsel seriously. I stayed the course. Longevity is a great benefit to our church. And there've been lots of ups and downs. I have to keep on embracing the hope and the positive and the joy and the privilege and letting go of some of the hard stuff that happens. And I'll circle back around to that book, Unoffendable. It captures this and it is a great ministry in your life if you're struggling with the challenges more than you are experiencing the joy and privilege of mission work. So, okay. Thank you so much for your time and your wisdom and just uh, your experience. You have, you've walked this road with a lot of missionaries and a lot of people in your church. And so thank you. And um, we just hope it's a blessing to a lot of our listeners. Yeah. Well, I do too. Uh, Lord bless all of you who are out there listening and thinking it's, it's a, it's a long and difficult road sometimes, but I'm glad you're doing what you do. Thank you, Brian. And uh, we just trust for God's blessing as you continue in that ministry. Well, Cara, uh, that was a great interview with Brian. And uh, obviously he has a heart for missions and for the missionaries that he takes care of. What was something that Brian said that that you really took away from this conversation? I really valued his um, outlook on uh, the communication with missionaries and how important it is that that's a two-way street. So often we want to hear from missionaries, we want to know what's going on with them so that we could be praying and supporting and the church can be aware of what's happening. But I love that Montevilla Baptist Church also takes on sending a newsletter to the missionaries and wanting them to know what's going on in the church body mm-hmm. so that it, it's a mutual relationship and communication and um, just the ways they've tried to be really intentional about that. Yeah, so that's great, the two-way street on communication. I know Dollar of the Month has been something that's actually been a lot of fun for our family over the years as we've been supported by Montevilla. And when they instituted the Dollar of the Month and we have been able to be beneficiaries of that on a few occasions. And it's just exciting to know that your church is doing something special for you and for your family, um, sending you money that that uh, you can just do something fun with, or maybe you have a particular need that's arisen and you weren't sure how that need was going to be met and, and these finances could be part of that. So that's something that's been particularly encouraging to us over the years. Yeah, and I love that dollar a month, too, because it meant that missions education was happening in Mm -hmm. the church in a really unique way. Yeah, yeah, for that whole Sunday, like he mentioned in the podcast, the the whole Sunday, so four Sundays in that month, that missionary's up in front, on the screen, or and even if the missionary's available, then he'll do a quick interview with them sometime during that month as well. So it just keeps the missionaries right in front of the people all the time, so... Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Brian today, and and hope I hope that uh, if you're involved in caring for missionaries in your church, maybe there's some things that you've taken away from here. So this is Steve, and this is Cara, and thanks for listening to the Innkeepers. Thank you for tuning in to the Innkeepers podcast. Our mission at Sanctuary Inn is to equip, refresh, and restore God's global workers for kingdom purposes. We hope today's podcast was an encouragement to you and maybe you were prompted to pass this along to someone you know that will benefit from today's conversation. Creating a podcast is a team effort. Cara and I prepare and do the interviews and we're grateful for the time that our guests give us out of their busy schedules to help us learn more about missionary care. We also want to thank Tim Downing for the music that he wrote and performed specifically for the Innkeepers podcast. Tim is a very talented musician, and you can learn more about him and his work at downingkeys.com. Our podcast is edited by Javier Bolanos and is produced by Tim Cowley of Cowley Visuals. If you have media needs, including film, photography, or audio, you can reach Tim at cowleyvisuals.com. Our website and show notes are prepared by Micah Gibbons, Cara's amazing husband. You can visit the Sanctuary Inn website and learn more about the ministry of Sanctuary Inn at sanctuaryinn.org. Thank you again for joining us on our journey to learn more about missionary care. See you next time.